Our Lord Jesus welcomes you to his house this evening, and I greet you in his powerful name. I welcome you to the original Black Friday, the one that costs us nothing because somebody else paid the price for us. I send greetings out tonight um, to the staff of the church that's been working so hard over the last few weeks to Dee, Tricia, Laura, Warren, Nettie, and Denise. We greet you. A happy birthday shout out to our prayer vine warrior Ginny tonight. And to the choir and to the bell choir, gosh, we miss you guys. My friends, don't forget to join us as we celebrate at 9.30 on Sunday morning, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, with Matthew's version, the most unusual of the resurrection occurrences. Let us pray. The Lord is my light, my light and salvation. In God I trust, in God I trust. The Lord is my light, my light and salvation. In God I trust, in God I trust. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being and his form marred beyond human likeness. So we will sprinkle, he will sprinkle many nations and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Come, let us worship God.
Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. But I say to all of you, from now on you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Messiah. Who hit you? Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor.
Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then he was accused by the chief priests and the elders. He gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds, by his wounds we are healed. He was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our sins the punishment that brought us peace was upon him by his wounds by his wounds we are healed we are healed
Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and mocked him, Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him. And took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they looked off, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it up in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. So it's been sitting right in front of us 
all these years, and I'm not sure how many of us have ever really made the connection. Made the connection in, in a powerful way. When you actually look at the way this story plays out in Matthew's gospel, you find these different key players. These different key players bouncing off one another, all contributing to what is about to happen. First, you have Jesus' stop before the high priests. He's at Caiaphas' house. There's the Sanhedrin, there's elders, there's scribes. They're all there. For lack of a better word, we want to call them the Hebrew people, we want to call them the Jewish leadership, but if you think about who they are and the time in which they dwell, they're the church. They're the church of Yahweh. They came through the exile. And out of the exile was birthed what was called the synagogue movement, the synagogue movement, the house church. These were people who were the ecclesia, the gathering. In Greek, it means church. So we're going to call them the church tonight. These are the people who should know better. These are the people who have been waiting and waiting for centuries after centuries for the one for the anointed one, the Messiah, the Mashiach in Hebrew. They were waiting for this one who would be anointed by God, who would be their rescuer. They have nobody to blame for them, but themselves for missing the point. They have drifted so far away from what Yahweh wanted for them that when the Messiah stands in front of them, the church misses it. The church misses the point. Instead, he is seen as a rival. Instead, he is seen as one who is upsetting the apple cart, challenging, becoming popular. All of that stuff he is doing, any number of the ways you can slice it, they were threatened by him. The church was threatened by their Messiah. So after this long night of kangaroo court, back and forth, not being able to make any charges stick on the man that they have arrested in the garden, finally two witnesses step up and make a claim. And he didn't say anything about destroying the temple. He talked about building up the kingdom in three days. This is what Caiaphas seizes on. This is what Caiaphas calls heresy. This is what he incites the rest of them into. The church has turned on her Messiah. Right at the very end of the verse that I was reading to you about that whole thing was, they spent the rest of the night trying to figure out how to have him killed. They figured it out. They figured it out. They couldn't, because of the Passover, they couldn't do the stoning. They couldn't necessarily have the blood on their hands in the midst of the Passover. So what do they do? They turn to the state. They turn to Pilate. They turn to the governor. They turn to the one who represents Caesar and Rome. This is who they turn to. The church turns to the state to get rid of their Messiah because he's a pretender, he's a heretic, and he's a threat. We turn now to the state. Pilate. Pilate is literally between a rock and a hard place. Pilate knows that this is an issue, but not an issue that he can resolve. This is not an issue that he can do because he's an innocent man. Pilate knows this. He's heard from his own wife that he's an innocent man. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. But he's got a man in the prison. How convenient, the man in the prison. This man in the prison is an insurrectionist. He's a brigand. 
He's notorious. His name in Matthew and in most of the early or many of the early manuscripts and why it's not footnoted, I don't know why. His name is Jesus Barabbas. Literally created, literally translated Jesus, which means God saves. And his, and the final name, son of a father. Jesus Barabbas. Pilate offers him up. Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus, the one you call Messiah? He gives them a choice. He gives the mob a choice. He gives the church a choice. Do you choose Jesus Barabbas, a man who is the son of a father, a son of the world? Or Jesus Messiah, one who is son of the Holy Father in heaven, the son of God? But he's more. He's more. Isn't it interesting that Pilate asks him right up front, are you the king of the Jews? That title, if you go back to Matthew chapter 2, chapter 3, when the Magi come to Herod, who are they looking for? The king of the Jews. Pilate asks, Are you the king of the Jews? The mockers make fun of him, king of the Jews. The sign above his head, king of the Jews. Another marker of the Messiah. Another marker of the anointed one. Pilate makes the offer, and the crowd chooses the Jesus of the world. Jesus Barabbas. They could have chose the Messiah. Instead, they chose Barabbas. Pilate washes his hands of the whole thing because he knows that the crowd is getting antsy. He knows that there could be a a big problem. He wants out. He said, I wash my hands of the blood of this man. And then they say those words, according to Matthew. The blood is upon us. The blood is upon our children. Church and state, hand in hand. Church and state dancing together. Both playing their part along with the mob to crucify Jesus. The one who is so clearly laid out in Isaiah 52, 53, the suffering servant. Isn't that just like God? Isn't that just like God? Throughout God's history, throughout Yahweh's history, He uses whatever He can to bring forth, to bear forth His story of grace, mercy, and love. He used the Egyptians. He used the Pharaoh to bring about an exodus and a deliverance which would set up the Hebrew community with all of the things that they would need to recognize the Messiah, including a Passover meal. He uses Assyria. He uses Babylon. He uses Persia. He uses the Greeks. He uses Rome. And now he uses church and state to bring the story of the Messiah home. Like an unusual and weird, twisted dance, they put it all together. And Jesus ends up on the cross for us. So tonight I ask you to think about it. To think about who you are. To think about whose you are. To think about why we're here tonight. 
Why are we here? Only six people in this room, but hundreds of you out there. Why are we here? In the modern church, one of, I think, our biggest crimes over the last few centuries, and maybe even since going all the way back to Constantine, one of the greatest crimes of all is there has been an unholy dance between church and state. And it's blurred the vision of the church. And the church has tried to use the state. Where do you stand tonight? If you were in that crowd that day, who would you choose? Would you choose Jesus, son of a father? Or would you choose Jesus, son of the father? The world? Or God? Where do you sit? How do you choose? Too often what ends up happening is we allow the world to get in the way. Time and time again, it's not just government, it's not just politics, it is everything in the world that can get in the way. Christians all over the place complain like crazy because come Easter morning, They have difficulty finding a seat in the church that they're at every single week, every single month faithfully, and yet the place is packed. And I say, sure, many of those people who do come in during Easter and come in during Christmas, come in during the holidays, many of those people, maybe there is too much on their plate that keeps them away, or maybe it's a choice. But before you judge them, consider yourselves. Why do you sit in the pew every single Sunday? Why do you go to Bible study every week or Sunday school? Why do you serve the way you serve? Do you serve because it makes you feel good? Is it about your power? Or is it about His? Is it about His power? His love, His grace, His blessing. And is what you do a reaction to that? Do you go to church because you have to go to church or do you go to church because you want to go to church? You must go to church. You're compelled to go to church because you love this one who died for you. So it's all on the table tonight, my friends. Some of you who are watching may not even be churched anywhere. I offer it up to you. I offer it to you to make a choice. A choice that I make and I make willingly. I'm here because I want to be. I'm here for all of you. Why? Because my Lord was here for all of us. My Lord was here for me. In this crisis... And in times of no crisis, he is there and he's loving us. Do you choose him, the one on the cross? Or do you choose the one who was released from jail that way, that day, and headed off, probably celebrating? Because it was a good Friday for him. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, 
wrapped it in clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite of the tomb. you to sing along with us from home. You've got the lyrics on your screen. Let this be a time of dedication and love as you pour out your hearts to the Lord. Would you sing with me?
Our charge tonight actually comes from the Apostle Paul. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. My friends, I bless you as the Hebrews have been blessing since the book of Deuteronomy. The Lord bless you and protect you. The Lord make his glory to shine upon you and be merciful to you. May the Lord lift his face to you and give you shalom.